welcome back uh, we are on week 9 of inverse methods in heat transfer uh, in this video i want to continue where i left off in the last video which was for logistic regression where we had discussed the forward model um so remember what logistic regression the model is for it is for binary classification binary classification is identifying which of two classes something so, some object or uh, some event or some image that you have given belongs to now in this remember i had talked about four things that we require for machine learning data representation um we require the forward model and we require the optimization algorithm and we require the loss function now for the forward model we need the data representation and as was discussed in the last video we give x as usual and y is described by a scalar which is either 0 or 1 y hat on the other hand is a real number which lies between 0 and 1 notice this is binary and uh, y hat itself is a real number okay so that's because this represents a probability that y belongs to class 1 for example if 1 represents uh, spam then y hat would be the probability that that email is spam we also saw the logistic regression forward model the forward model is fairly simple if you have some x vector which has multiple features um, which are from x1 through xn it has multiple components for example i gave you the example of uh, body temperature and cough but you could think of temperature pressure velocity uh, anything of that sort okay so uh, any n features that we have all the forward model does is fairly simple does a linear combination and if it ended here it would simply be linear regression but then since we want the output between 0 and 1 and we don't want a real number in any range we actually add this sigmoid function at the end the sigmoid basically turns uh, serves two purposes turns it between 0 and 1 and you can also interpret now the output as a probability algebraically we can write the same thing as uh, what is written on the right hand side here so you can write this as w0 plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2 so on and so forth up till w1 xn and i have taken the liberty of putting w0 as w0 x0 just so that it looks uh, symmetric where x0 basically is the constant one so you can think of this as x0 so we can write this as the summation between uh, 0 to n of wy xi the question now is this we already can do the forward model therefore given uh, an, an x um, and given a w you can find out y hat the question is given a data set can you find out wi so this of course is our standard inverse problem okay now i am going to take a very simple example um this is an example like this i'll first show the figure and i'll give it in terms which are a little bit more familiar to you um let me redraw this okay so let's say this is instead of calling it x and y let's say there are two features x1 and x2 and we have our output our output is like this um you get a green at three locations and you get a red at one of the locations now these three locations are like this this is the only data set okay so this is one comma one this is one comma zero this is zero comma zero and this is zero comma one if we write it as a table the table looks like this you have simply just four data points one two three four not hundreds not thousands just four data points and we want a classified line for this of course the classifying line you can imagine would be something of this sort we'll come back to this that's where we want to land up um so here is x x is if it is 0 comma 0 then the output is 0 if it is 1 comma 0 the output is 1 if 0 comma 1 the output is 1 and if it is 1 comma 1 the output is 1 this is the ground truth and we want a classifying line which will classify this and so that if you give any new point let's say give a point here it can be located correctly as either 0 or 1 now what does this remind you of this data set is of course a simple or data set 
Okay, so you can imagine this just as the OR gate. Historically, this was a very important example as far as logistic regression. Well, not really logistic regression, but neural networks were concerned. The idea was this. The idea was that if you can simulate the basic gates, basic logic gates, OR gate, AND gate, OR NOR gate, etc., then you can basically simulate any gate at all. And therefore, anything that a computer can do can be simply achieved using logistic regression or simple networks. As we will see, just like linear regression, I showed you that can be interpreted as a neural network model. Logistic regression is also a uh, an example of a neural network model. Okay, now given this data set, let's ask a question. What set of W will achieve this gate. Okay. So, what set of W will achieve this gate using logistic regression? Now, I'm going to do this in two ways. One of this uh, is purely by inspection. What does that mean? We'll just guess some weights and see whether we can make it work. And the second is I'll show you how to do it through gradient descent. Now, I want to warn you, when I do it through gradient descent, I will not give you the actual weights uh, that I will give you here. In this case, I will just give you the process. Okay. So first, we will try to do this purely by intuition and inspection. Okay. So let's look at this data set again. Okay. The data set looks like this. I will draw it bigger in order for, for this to be convenient, 0, 0, I get a 0, 1, 0, I get a 1, 0, 1, I get a 1, and 1, 1, I again obtain a 1. Okay, so this is my y. Now here it is, I want my y hat. Now by inspection, what I know is this, my model is y hat is g of z, Remember the logistic regression model. Z is W0 plus W1X1 plus W2X2. Again, for your convenience, let me just draw this. Since you're starting this out, I'll redraw the model just so that you remember it. And here is Y hat. The output that comes out at this end is called Z. At this end is called A and A is basically Y hat. We have W0, W1, W2. Okay. Now, if I want the output to be 0, uh, you will remember from my previous videos that this means that, really speaking, this one will never be exactly 0 because this is simply a sigmoid. Okay? G was simply a sigmoid of Z. So, what we can expect is this is greater than 0.5, sorry, less than 0.5. This is what we did for the success failure cases. If we get the probability that it belongs to class 1 is very uh, small, it's less than 0.5, then I would have classified it as a 0. Okay, I'll come to a clear picture representation of this later. But these two should be greater than 0.5. Okay. So we have identified in this case that y hat should be less than 0.5. But y hat less than 0.5 means that g of z is less than 0.5. g of z is 1 by 1 to the e power minus z is less than 0.5. This will require for e power minus z to be greater than 1. This requires z is negative. So this we know. We know that the failure cases are on one side. They are on z less than 0. Okay. So for example, in this figure, one side of it, let's say this side of it is z less than 0. This side of it is z greater than 0. Okay. So that's really what we want to achieve through our process. So z less than 0. Now, z is less than 0 means 
W0 plus W1X1 plus W2X2 is less than 0. Now we already know this data point. This was X1 was 0 and X2 was 0. So this tells us W0 is less than 0. This also tells us the importance of having a what is known as a bias unit. Okay, So without this constant term, I cannot make this model work. So this constant term is called the bias unit in neural networks. Okay, Coming back here, I have seen that W0 is less than 0. Now what about the next data point? We had the case that when x1 is equal to 1 and x2 is equal to 0, this gave us y hat was greater than 0.5 because it is supposed to be classified as 1. So your probability that it is 1 better be greater than 0.5. So this gives us w0 plus w1, x1 is 1, w1, 1 plus w2 times 0 is greater than, so this will imply z is positive. If y is greater than 0.5, z has to be greater than 0. So this should be greater than 0. It gives us w0 plus w1 is greater than 0. So we have these two equations or inequalities. So let's make some choice. Let's say w0 is minus 3 okay, and uh, w1 we can just choose it to be 1 or let us say 2. Okay, I'll just choose it to be 2. Well, sorry. I can choose it to be 4. Okay. So that W0 plus W1 is greater than 0. So these two conditions are then satisfied. Now, next data point is x1 equal to 0, x2 equal to 1. And this gives us y hat is again greater than 0.5 because this also was a uh, uh, output equal to one case. So again, our probability has to be uh, greater than 0.5. This in turn gives us z is greater than zero again. So w0 plus w1 times zero plus w2 times one is greater than zero. So this tells us w0 plus w2 greater than 0. We can say, let's say w2 equal to 4. So finally, we have just four data points which we need to satisfy. Obviously, in reality, you will have thousands. But here it was x1 equal to 1, x2 equal to 1, y hat had to be greater than 0.5. Again, z has to be greater than 0. So you get w0 plus w1 plus w2 greater than 0, which is true because w0 we decided was minus 3, this is 4, this is 4. So we actually achieve um, our end by choosing these four, uh, these three weights. So we can say that OR gate is a network or a neural network, I will call it a neural network with weights like this, 1, x1, x2, minus 3, 4, 4, sigma and a sigmoid followed by y hat. Typically, as I had said before, we will put both these together into one big circle neuron with two functions, a linear function and a nonlinear function sitting within it. So if you do this, of course, at the end of y hat, let me draw this clearly, 1, x1, x2. And let's say I am encompassing that in a single neuron. Outside of this is my y hat. But after that, I need to undergo a step function. A step function, which is y hat equal to 1 if or let's call this instead of y hat, let's call this uh, something else. y tilde equal to 1 if y hat greater than 0.5 and y tilde equal to 0 if y hat less than 0.5. Because at the final end, we still have to work with the gate and say whether it is 1 or 0. In that case, uh, 
um, we will go till here and then we will make a sharp threshold. Okay, so, this is called a thresholding. Okay, so what was the point of all this? The point of all this was we can satisfy our uh, conditions of this sort simply by inspection. Okay, just by looking at it or by intuition or by doing some calculations, we were able to find out some weights W0, W1, W2. But for more complex cases, obviously, we cannot. On in these cases, we will rely okay, in general. We require uh, gradient descent. Okay. So when we take gradient descent, which way do we work? We work somewhat similar to the process that we had. This was a rough trial and error process. But gradient descent, as you all know, is like this. You make a guess for a W. You put this value here. Put 0, 0. You will get... Um, y hat equal to sigmoid of w0 plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2. So w means we of course give w0, w1, w2. We give a guess that feeds in here. It makes a prediction for y hat. But that y hat will not match y. So we require a loss function. So in order for gradient descent to fun function, we require Two things we require loss function, which will take in j, j will take in y, our ground truth, and y hat, my prediction from the model. And basically, it will give me a gap, okay, which I can sum. All right, so why not use our least square function? j of y y hat equal to half y minus y hat square. So there are several problems with this. I am going to mention only one. Okay, so this is like I am going to wave my hands and give you a rough reason why this kind of thing doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is notice y is either 0 or 1. And y hat always lies in the range 0 and 1. So j is always going to be very small even for misclassification. For example, let's say a person does not have cancer and I am guessing a model. Okay, I have guessed the W and that model tells me that that person has cancer. Now, these are serious consequences. You can't just have a small correction for the fact that somebody who entirely had no cancer is being predicted as a person who is having cancer. Okay, like I said, this is a rough reason. There are more technical reasons why this is true, but I am going to skip that for now. Because of that, this is not severe enough This is not severe enough on wrong classification. So we need a model which is severe on wrong classification. So the requirements for a general, we are going to call it binary classification. Okay. I am going to finally call it BCE for another reason. But for binary classification, we have some requirements. One, of course, is when uh, y equal to y hat, that is when you classify correctly, this means j of y y hat should of course be 0. But when y and y hat are completely off, by completely off, I mean y hat says approximately 1 when y is approximate, when y is exactly 0, then we want j of y y hat to be very high. Now notice when you do linear regression, this problem is not there. If you actually, your scope of y and y hat is infinite. A w0 plus w1x without sigmoid for y hat can grow as large as you want. Whereas this is not the case for logistic regression. It is squeezed. The function is squeezed to be between 0 and 1, which is why this problem exists. Okay, So there are a few other requirements also 
uh, but I am not going to write that uh, explicitly. I will give you a cost function which does at least the above two. This is called the binary cross entropy loss function okay, or cost function. This is what is used for uh, logistic regression and it functions in the following way. So you say that j of y comma y hat is equal to minus y ln y hat plus 1 minus y ln 1 minus y hat. Okay. So let's look at this expression in slightly more detail. So what we do is think about what each of these terms can be. So here are the possibilities. So let me write down the possibilities. Possibility 1 is that the ground truth y is 0 and y hat is approximately 0. Remember y hat is sigmoid of z. It can never exactly be 0. It can only be approximately 0 because you have 1 by 1 plus e power minus z. Okay. So let's look at what happens in this case. What will happen in this case is that y is 0. So the first term is 0. The second term, so let's call this j1, let's call this j2. Okay, So j1 is 0 because y is 0 and ln of something approximately 0. So we don't care about what it is. It's multiplying 0. Let's look at j2. j2 is 1 multiplying ln of 1 minus a term which is epsilon. Okay, It's approximately 0. So this is approximately ln of 1. So, which is approximately 0. So, this tells us that j is approximately 0 if both y are 0 as well as y hat or y hat is 0. Second, y is 1 and y hat is also 1. Now, let us look at this j1. The first term is this term is 1, 1 multiplied by ln of a term which is approximately 1, let us say it is 1 plus epsilon plus 1 minus y, notice y is 1, so this is 0, okay. nothing else. So this is approximately ln of 1, so this is again approximately 0, so this also gives us approximately 0. So we satisfy the condition that when y and y hat are approximately the same or when we get the same class in both cases, the cost is 0. So, I am not going to penalize a case where which something has been classified correctly. But let us look at the second case. y equal to 0, but y hat equal to 1. Okay. In this case, j 1, the first term, the first term here is minus y ln y hat. Okay. So, minus y ln y hat is 0 okay, because y is 0. What about j2? j2 is minus 1 minus y ln 1 minus y hat. Now let us look at this. Now this is minus 1 times ln 1 minus y hat is approximately 1. So let us say it is 1 minus epsilon, it will be a little bit less than epsilon. Actually, here too, I should have changed it to 1 minus epsilon because uh, y hat always changes between 0 and 1. It can never be 1 plus epsilon. Okay, coming back here, what I am saying is that this term is 1 exactly and this term is approximately 0. This is equal to minus ln of epsilon where epsilon is very, very small. Why is that? Because y hat is approximately 1. It is almost close to 1. Let us say it is 0 0.999. Then you will get ln of 0 0.001. Which means this term, as you can see, epsilon tends to 0 means j2 tends to infinity. What this tells us is the loss 
tends to infinity for the binary cross entropy in case you misclassify. Okay. Similarly, I will just leave this as an exercise in order to not bore you. So, similarly, if y equal to 1 and y hat equal to approximately equal to 0, j will again be quite large. So, misclassification gets penalized heavily. Okay. So, we basically put together these two terms. Now, where did these two terms magically appear from? Unfortunately, I don't have the time. You can show a derivation from probability theory for this too. Just like we did for the least square term, we can show it with this with some binomial distribution or a Bernoulli distribution. But I will not get into that. So, currently, suppose assuming this term comes, it satisfies these very two important properties that when y predicts correctly, y is predicted correctly, your error is zero. But when y's prediction is completely off, that is it misclassifies, then the cost function becomes very, very high. Okay, great. So what? We still need the gradient. Once we have j to update w, we need <clears throat> del j, del w. Okay. So how do we find out del j, del w with logistic regression. So, let us look at that shortly now, um, just so that we have a complete idea of how to establish gradient descent in this case. Okay. So, now we have del j del w. Let us say I want to do del j del w 1. This will be the same as del j del y hat into del y hat del w1. Okay. What are the relationships we know? We know that y hat equal to sigmoid of z. What is z? z is w0 plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2. Okay. What is j? j we just wrote is minus y ln y hat plus 1 minus y ln 1 minus y hat. So, let us differentiate these terms one by one. First thing, we want del j del y hat, this term. All right. So, del j del y hat is, you can see here, minus of y by y hat plus 1 minus y by 1 minus y hat. Okay, this is the first term. So let us note this now. Next, we want del y hat by del w1. But y hat does not directly depend on w1. Okay, so you see a chain. First, w1 affects z and z affects y hat. Okay, I will show this process very clearly in the next week's video. But for now, just remember this. So, instead of calculating this directly, we say del y hat del w1 is del y hat del z into del z del w1. Okay. Now, del z del w1 is straightforward. Okay. So, del z del w1 is simply x1. So, this term is x1. I will leave this as equation 2. We have this term now. What is del y hat del z? This we do not know. As you can see, we have to step by step unravel what is happening down here. Okay. So, del y hat del z. <clears throat> Where y hat is 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus z. Okay. So, now I differentiate this. So, dy hat, it is actually just dy hat dz in this case. This is minus 1 by the denominator square multiplied by the derivative of this with respect to z, which is minus e to the power minus z, which is e to the power minus z by 1 plus e to the power minus z, the whole square. Okay. Now, when you see this, you can split it further. This is just as a trick. 
e to the power minus z by 1 to the power 1 plus e to the power minus z multiplied by 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus z. Okay, so this is dy hat dz. This second term here is simply the original y hat that we have. You can notice this. Now, the second term, the first term here, if you calculate 1 minus y hat, it will be 1 minus 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus z. You can just take this up. You will get e power minus z by 1 plus e power minus z. Okay, so this term is 1 minus y hat. So this is a convenient expression, which is dy hat dz equal to y hat into 1 minus y hat if y hat is sigmoid. You might also see this uh, uh, at other places as sigmoid prime z equal to <coughs> sigmoid of z into 1 minus sigmoid of z, which has the same meaning as what we have derived so far. Okay. So let's call this equation 3. Okay. So if we put together 1, 2, and 3, we get the following relationship. We get del j del w1 equal to del j del y hat del y hat del z del z del w1. Let's look at this term. <coughs> Del j del y hat was minus y over y hat plus 1 minus y over 1 minus y hat into y hat into 1 minus y hat. That is this term into x1. Okay. So this can be simplified a little bit further. So let's multiply this. This is y into 1 minus y hat plus 1 minus y into y hat, the whole into x1, y minus y y hat, y y hat, sorry, there should be a minus here, plus, one, minus one, plus y y hat. <clears throat> this should be a minus. Yeah. So if you put these together, you get y hat minus y into x1. So this gives us del j by del w1 is y hat minus y into x1. This happens to be the same expression. as linear regression. So linear regression's gradient, if you go and look back, has exactly the same expression. I'll explain why uh, actually at the beginning of next week. Why is it that we are getting the same expression here as well as the other place? So as it turns out, you can write one single program to do the gradient of both linear regression as well as logistic regression. So it's a very simple idea, as I had told you earlier, uh, weeks uh, during uh, gradient descent, sorry, during linear regression is um, the gradient with respect to W1 is simply the error multiplied by the activation. So what do we have here? Our algorithm is very simple um, in order to use logistic regression. Guess for W is the first guess. Then for data set, let's say we are doing a batch gradient descent, then uh, just calculate y hat using w. Then find gradient, w equal to w minus alpha times del j del w, where gradient del j del any of the w's j is simply sigma of y hat minus y into xj. So this is very, very similar. In fact, it is identical um, to what we did with linear regression. So where was linear regression different? The difference was finding this y hat. Y hat does not have a sigmoid in uh, linear regression, whereas it has a sigmoid as far as logistic regression is concerned. 
So what we did in this video was look at a couple of things. We defined this binary cross entropy loss function. We, that's why I called it B C E. So binary cross entropy loss function, you find out the binary cross entropy loss function and then you take this gradient. Okay, so the gradient looked a little bit complex. In fact, what we will do next week is essentially automate this process of uh, taking the gradient. Uh, I have made a mistake here too. You can correct your notes. There should be a minus here um, because when I differentiate 1 minus y, there should be a minus coming up front. So that's what reflects here in the final uh, negative term here. So you put that together, you get a simple expression for the gradient and you can just update it. So this data set or any other data set indeed, which we will show in several demos the next week, I'm not keeping any demos. This week is primarily just a theoretical class. So if we look at a data set like this, all you would do is make prediction, make prediction, make prediction, make prediction, add the four, divide by four. So that's your uh, gradient. Now calculate the gradient as sigma of y hat minus y multiplied by x. Just keep on repeating and you will find a weight which will magically land up here. So it, it's more or less like magic when you actually see it in demonstration. So I will show you this R gate demonstration in the next video. Now, in the next video, I want to address a few more things. So we looked at the case where we have only two classes. But what happens when we have multiple classes? So this case, um, we will see in the next video. So I will see you in the next video. Thank you.